Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game that needs no introduction. A near-perfect game with amazing graphics, great gameplay, and incredible living virtual world in which the player explores. Along with all these feats comes a gripping narrative that will cause the players to put themselves in the shoes of Arthur Morgan, who is a member of the Vanderlyn gang. RDR 2's narrative is defined as a spatial narrative, with a large amount of environmental storytelling elements. A spatial narrative is one that is episodic and jumps from set piece to set piece. While the narrative does have a set start and end, missions within chapters can be done in essentially any order that you want. The order in which you choose to do missions will also change the dialogue between Arthur and his gang, as while you may be doing missions for John, Charles, and Sadie, they will mention your actions with other members of the gangs, such as Dutch, or your efforts to assist the Wapiti. The narrative of RDR2 follows Arthur and his gang as they are hunted by the Pinkerton Detective Agency and shows us that it is never too late to change. Arthur grows through the plot and his perspective on the world and his way of life changes. This growth is forced due to social factors and those he is surrounded with, but also due to coming to terms with his own mortality after being diagnosed with tuberculosis. So just what does a game that follows a criminal and the downfall of his gang have to do with indigenous people? Well, as the Vanderlyn gang is hunted across America, there are many interactions throughout the narrative that coincide with the Wapiti people. The Wapiti are a fictional Native American tribe created for the world of Red Dead. While the Wapiti are fictional, they are not just a tribe designed to show off American Indians. Instead, what Rockstar has created is a way to shine light on real events while being set in a fictional setting, in this case, New Hanover, Anne Marino, and Saint Denis. While the Wapiti are fiction, their tribe and plotline are not all made up for the sake of a gripping narrative. Instead, the plight of the Wapiti uses indigenous and American history as a blueprint for their story in RDR2. Today, we'll be looking at the historical inspirations for the Wapiti, as well as developing an academic analysis of the native narrative in Red Dead Redemption 2. Let's start with just who the Wapiti are. The Wapiti are, as already stated, a fictional tribe that is a composite of many Native American groups. The groups the Wapiti are based on come from the Plains and Rocky Mountain regions. This is known due to the ways in which the Wapiti respond to narrative plot points such as encroachment, broken treaties, military confrontation, and industrialists. The tribe the Wapiti bear the most resemblance to is the Lakota. This is the most direct real-life inspiration of the Wapiti tribe. We will touch on reasons for how this is known in later missions. However, we look at the geography of the fictional states New Hanover and Amarino, they encompass many aspects from the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain states such as Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, South Dakota, and Wyoming. All of these states, especially South Dakota, is where the Lakota were located starting in 1775, and stayed there hunting and following bison as a nomadic people. The Lakota roamed the Black Hills of South Dakota for some 100 years, until being forced onto reservations. We can accompany Charles Smith on an optional hunting mission in either Chapter 2 or 3 of the game, this mission shows Charles taking Arthur hunting for bison, and on the way to a herd, Charles Smith explains what the bison provide for the Plains people. My mother used to tell me stories of how her tribe moved with the bison. They lived almost as one. The bison went where people went. They were the center of all life. We couldn't survive without them. They provided us with everything. Food, clothing, shelter, tools. There was a lot of respect. The relationship between the Plains tribes and bison as described by Charles is a true account. John Fire Lamedeer was a Lakota medicine man born in the early 1900s, had this to say about the relationship between bison and Indians. The buffalo gave us everything we needed. Without it, we were nothing. When you killed off the buffalo, you also killed the Indian. Killing off bison is something that is seen in this mission as carcasses can be found with their bodies rotting. At one time, the plains were home to millions of bison with tales of migrating herds shaking the plains as they moved. However, by 1900, there were only 300 bison remaining. This near extinction of the American bison came from poaching, as well as targeted attacks on bison to limit the Plains Indians' primary food source. Though in the game the poachers were paid to kill the bison to make the indigenous people look like savages, or to instigate another Indian war, this was not the case in real world history. The bison were hunted to limit the power of the native people. As already stated, native people relied on buffalo for almost everything. Kill the buffalo, kill the Indian. In Chapter 4 there is a quest called American Fathers 2, and in this mission Arthur is officially introduced to Chief Rainsfall and his son Eagle Flies. My people, if we are even a people anymore, we've fought hard. We've made peace treaties, and those treaties were broken, and we've been moved and punished and punished and moved. I'm sure. And now I am told we are to be moved again. Clearly contravening the peace treaty signed three years ago. This unfortunately is a historical accuracy. The United States has a well-documented history of making treaties with tribes and then breaking those same treaties. 
The first treaty made between the United States and a Native American tribe was the Treaty of Fort Pitt in 1778 between the United States and the Lenape people. This treaty would allow U.S. soldiers to cross Lenape land during the Revolutionary War, and after signing this treaty, both parties would help each other out and fight off the British. That is until the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. In 1782, four years after the treaty was signed, Pennsylvania militiamen massacred a Lenape community. The Lenape left the Ohio Valley, with their descendants being those of the Delaware Nation. Following the Revolutionary War, three treaties were signed with the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chickasaw Nations in the mid-1780s. These treaties would be known as the Treaty of Hopewell. Each of these treaties extended protection to the tribes, and all three ended with the same sentence. The hatchet shall be forever buried, in peace given by the United States of America. Even during the signing of the Treaty of Hopewell, settlers continued to expand to the lands of the Cherokee. By 1791, another treaty would be signed, forcing the Cherokee to forfeit even more land. Many more treaties would be signed, including in the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868. This treaty would designate the Black Hills of Dakota as the Great Sioux Reservation exclusive territory of the Sioux, which included the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Arapaho people. After gold was found in the Black Hills, more and more settlers began to move into the land seeking their fortune. The native tribes of the Black Hills would try to resist the violation of their treaty. However, their resistance would end with the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. Over 100 years later in 1980, the Supreme Court agreed the land taken from the Sioux was wrongfully stolen, and over $100 million was set aside as compensation. However, the Sioux have continuously refused these reparations worth over a billion dollars today. The Sioux continue to refuse the money because taking the money is paramount to a sales transaction. And as Ross Swimmer, former special trustee of the American Indians put it, they didn't want the money, they wanted the Black Hills. The reason the Fort Laramie Treaty was the last one broke is because by 1871, Congress ended the practice of making treaties with Native American tribes, declaring henceforth no Indian nation or tribe shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty. Instead of the United States government breaking treaties, they opted to just not make any. This is where the game takes use of its creative liberty, as the narrative takes place in 1899 and treaties are still in use between the Wapiti and the U.S. government. However, if we continue this interaction with Rain's Fall and Eagle Flies, we learn the Wapiti are to be removed from their reservation. It's to do with oil. I know it is, but I need the proof. This statement holds a real-life counterpart and happens around the same time as it does in game. In 1894, oil was discovered underneath the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma, and in 1896, petroleum developer Henry Foster would receive drilling rights from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, with the stipulation of the Osage Nation to receive a 10% royalty on all sales. Now we will skip to chapter 6, where in the mission A Rage Unleashed, Eagle Flies visits the Vanderlyn camp and to ask for assistance. That's Vanderlyn. How do you do? Not well, sir. Well, I am sorry to hear that. How's your father? Father is confused. Wisdom with weakness. His people, my people, we've suffered too much, been lied to too much. Now they've taken our horses. Who? The infantry division posted at Fort Wallace. Why? Colonel Favors is a liar and a murderer. His people won't stop until we're all dead. Without horses, we cannot hunt. Without hunting, we will starve. This is another act of war. The stealing of horses was a rather common occurrence as the U.S. government would do anything if it meant weakening the Plains tribes. Alongside killing bison, horses were another target of the U.S. government. The year 1876 is referred to as the year we lost our horses among the Lakota people. This might seem bizarre as this was the year the Battle of Little Bighorn was won. However, after this U.S. defeat, the slaughter of bison was amped up, and a law was made forcing all natives to surrender their horses. All native horses from Oklahoma to Montana would be rounded up and either sold or slaughtered. General Philip Sheridan is quoted saying, make them poor by destruction of their stock, and then settle them on the lands allotted to them. Four years following the Battle of Little Bighorn, Chief Sitting Bull's band would surrender at Fort Buford, and their herd of 350 horses would be confiscated and put up for sale at the local trading posts. There is debate as to whether the descendants of these 350 horses currently roam the Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. Later in the mission, as we ride with Eagle Flies, he says, Tell me about this Colonel Favors. He's a vile man. He and his regiment take pleasure of persecuting us. All the young have been taken from our reservation, shipped off to reform schools. Many women, too. The forcible admission of young Native Americans into boarding schools is a well-documented tradition. Native American boarding schools or Indian boarding schools were established in the late 19th century, with the goal being to kill, annihilate, or assimilate indigenous peoples and eradicate indigenous culture. This era of Native American assimilation began in 1819 after the passing of the Civilization Fund Act. This act encouraged American education to be provided to indigenous societies and would enforce the civilization process. The boarding school experience for young indigenous people would begin in 1860 when the Bureau of Indian Affairs established the first Indian boarding school in Washington. 
It was believed by many during this time that operating boarding schools off reservation would provide a more successful assimilation process. Carlisle Indian School was the most famous or infamous off reservation Indian boarding school and was established in 1879. It was run by Colonel Richard Henry Pratt, who operated as headmaster for 25 years. Pratt's working motto was kill the Indian, save the man. To ensure complete assimilation, all signs of tribal cultural life were ended. Braids worn by young native boys were cut, uniforms were given, and white names were assigned to the children. Students were also forbidden to speak their native language, even amongst themselves. These students faced many forms of neglect and abuse, including physical, sexual, cultural, and spiritual. It was not until 1978 that the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed. This act allowed for Native American parents the legal right to refuse forced placement of their children in boarding schools. And yes, you did hear me correctly. This act was passed in 1978, nearly 120 years after this issue began. Some good, honest conflict between the Army and the Indians might be just the distraction we need. Indian is a term that has been and is still in use to describe indigenous people, especially those in the United States. The term Indian can be traced back to Christopher Columbus as he believed that he had arrived in the Indies, his intended destination on his voyage in 1492. The term Native American was coined in the 1960s to replace Indian as a more acceptable term. However, even this comes with its own issues, as America is named after Amerigo Vespucci, a 16th century explorer who is said to have been the one to discover the Americas. These terms all have their problems, however a lot of the debate surrounding these terms has ended due to them being in use for so long. It is reasonable to say, instead of labeling a people, that a people should be able to give themselves a name. At the end of the mission, a rage unleashed. Charles will ask Arthur if he can speak with Rain's Fall. And if Arthur agrees to speak with Rain's Fall, it'll unlock additional story missions for the player to tackle, starting with Archaeology for Beginners. Before we tackle that next mission though, I am going to put a trigger warning here, as the topics and discussion of this next section will involve sexual assault, as well as graphic details involving historical events. I'm just putting this here so if you're not in the right mindset to hear about that, or you're just not wanting to become too upset at the history of America, then now is your time to skip to the next chapter of the video. Colonel Favors, he has already exacted some measure of revenge for the raid. Two women were assaulted by his men. This is an unfortunate truth to the history of the Americas. The tradition of violence against women can be traced back as early as 1492 going back to Columbus in his first voyage in which Taino women were raped. Upon Columbus's second voyage in 1493, which consisted of 1,200 soldiers, sailors, and Catholic friars, the troops were said to have gone wild, raping native women as well as killing, torturing, and enslaving native people with extraordinary brutality. This type of treatment toward native people and indigenous women continues today. However, to relate it to the time frame of the game, that is 1899, we're going to talk about the Sand Creek and Washtenaw massacres. The 1864 Sand Creek massacre took place in southeastern Colorado, Colonel John Chivington led an attack on tribes encamped in Sand Creek with an army 700 strong. Before the massacre occurred, Chivington was informed the tribes of Sand Creek were camped under a white flag of truce. However, Chivington, who was known as a rabid Indian hater and is quoted saying kill and scalp all, little and big, would continue with his plans of assault. After the men had left to hunt, his regiment would attack. This would result in the slaughter of about 230 Cheyenne and Arapaho people, consisting mostly of women, children, and elderly. Nearly all were killed and their deaths were followed by horrible mutilation. Lieutenant James D. Connor would recount the events saying, their bodies were mutilated in the most horrible manner. Men, women, and children's privates cut out. I heard of numerous instances in which men had cut out the private parts of females and stretched them over the saddle bows and wore them over their hats while riding in the ranks. All these matters were subject of general conversation and could not help being known by Colonel J.M. Chivington. There is a connection that can be made between John Chivington and RDR2's Colonel Favors, but we will elaborate on that during the mission to find art of conversation. Four years after the Sand Creek Massacre, in 1868, the Battle of Washtenaw would occur. This battle would take place in modern-day Cheyenne, Oklahoma. On November 27th, the 7th Cavalry, led by Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer, would attack Chief Black Kettle's camp. Chief Black Kettle had been a survivor of the Sand Creek Massacre four years prior, and knowing of the military presence nearby had been planning on moving his tribe to a larger Cheyenne encampment. Unfortunately, the army would attack first. After the battle, Chief Black Kettle and an intermediate number of Cheyenne were killed, with 53 women and children captured. There is debate as to the number of casualties in this battle. The Cheyenne claims only 11 men died and the rest were women and children, and it is widely accepted that Custer inflated the numbers of native casualties. There is also credible evidence that following the attack, Custer and his men took sexual liberties with female captives. With one historian writing, there was a saying among the soldiers of the western frontier, a saying Custer and his officers could heartily endorse, Indian women rape easy. Continuing archaeology for beginners, Rains Fall and Arthur approach the sacred site. No! 
You destroyed everything. No, I need to find the Chinupa. Chinupa is a Lakota word for sacred pipe. Many people refer to the sacred pipe as a peace pipe, however, this is a misnomer. The sacred pipe plays a key role in Lakota's spiritual and cultural life. It is said the pipe was given to the Lakota by the white buffalo calf woman. It is difficult to sum up the intricacies of belief that surround the pipe, and as a non-indigenous person myself, I won't pretend to know anything about it. However, it is important to note that each part of the pipe, stem, bowl, tobacco, breath, and smoke, is symbolic of the fundamental relationships among plants, animals, humans, elements, and spiritual being that keeps the cosmos in motion. After archaeology for beginners, Arthur has an opportunity to help Monroe retrieve vaccinations for the Wapiti in the mission Honor Amongst Thieves. The Indian Vaccination Act of 1832 appropriated $12,000 to vaccinate native people living near white frontier settlements against smallpox. This was pushed by settlers as well due to fear that Indian populations will spread disease to them, even though throughout history transmission of disease was more likely than not from white to Indian. Due to lack of funding, many army doctors refused to assist in vaccination efforts. This left army personnel and those who did not have traditional medical training to administer vaccines to native populations. This seems to be the inspiration for the role of Captain Monroe in the story. Only a few tribes were allowed to receive the vaccine, mostly consisting of tribes Congress deemed as friendly or with important economic roles, or tribes being forced to move west, such as Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole. By 1833, more than 17,000 native people had been vaccinated. A regional agent, Jay Dotery, wanted the program to continue the vaccination movement north, however this request was declined. This led to tribes like the Medan losing 90% of their tribe throughout a five-year epidemic. Other tribes near the Medan, such as Arikara and Hidatsta, are estimated to have lost about half of their population to both the disease as well as suicide. These three tribes, Mandan, Arikara, and Hidatsta, which I most likely butchered in pronunciation, would endure and combine forces for protection, economic, and social survival, however would maintain separate cultural identities. The vaccine Arthur steals from Monroe is never specified. However, if we look at some of the inspirations for characters such as Monroe, it is likely a safe assumption to say that it is a smallpox vaccine. Continuing through the story in the mission, The Fine Art of Conversation, Charles Smith convinces Arthur to attend a meeting between Rains Fall and Colonel Favors. Colonel Favors, Captain Monroe, we come in peace. Hello again. Who are these two? They're uh, friends of my people. Hmm. Interesting looking fellows. Yeah, they won't cause any trouble. Well, I should hope not. Yeah. Listen, Mr. Um, <coughs> Chief. Yes, uh, Mr. I can't say that silly name, is it? In English, they call me Rainsfall. Yes, yes, I'm mine. Uh, I'm sure they do. Native American naming traditions vary from tribe to tribe. However, they typically are derived from nature, represented by an animal symbolizing desirable characteristics or a certain trait. These names often reveal something about the character or temperament of a person or place. Some native people receive more than one name due to significant character changes or growth, leading to the saying, legal names are given, but Native American names are earned. Rainsfall names bears resemblance to famous Lakota leaders such as Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse. This connection is no surprise given that we see Rainsfall speak the Lakota language in this mission. <laughs> This way. After Arthur is taken to the side due to his coughing episode, he can overhear soldiers talking about Colonel Favors. care about the Indians, because he doesn't want to back down. I mean, his whole professional life. We know what they say about him. High tail Favors, the man who missed a battle. This conversation is where we can finally talk about the connections between Colonel Favors and Colonel John Chivington. To start with the obvious, both have the distinction of Colonel. However, if we look into the finer details of Chivington, there is debate around his heroism during the Battle of Glorieta Pass, with accusations of him strutting under in valor, much like Favors in his efforts to fix his reputation. However, the largest connection between Colonel Favors and John Chivington is the environment these two men have fostered within their regiments. While Favors doesn't do anything quite as heinous as Sand Creek Massacre in the game, he is responsible for assault of women, withholding vaccines, and destruction of sacred sites in order to start a war with the native tribes. The next mission we're going to take a look at is My Last Boy. Mr. Vanderlyn, Mr. Morgan, Charles, they try to kill my people for oil, for oil. Today we ride once more. Ride with me, ride with us. Ride with us against the factory. I love your courage, son. It is a thing of great beauty. Stop! Everyone, stop! My son, my last son, don't. When I was your age, I fought. I saw death. I have killed. 
The men I knew were slain. It is unknown as to whether or not these battles Rainsfall is referring to are part of the fictional conflicts within the Red Dead universe. However, if we look at this with an academic lens, we might infer that he is referring to the Sioux Wars, which occurred between 1851 and 1890, and encompassed many different battles. Or perhaps he's referring to the Great Sioux War, which took place between 1876 and 1877, and would pit the Lakota Sioux and Northern Cheyenne against the U.S. government, and would lead to the establishment of permanent reservations in the country. The wars are over. We have lost. These young men will be annihilated. Rainsfall is right here. The Wounded Knee Massacre was the last major conflict between the native tribes in the U.S. and took place in 1890. During this time, army soldiers arrived at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota to stop ghost dance rituals, and is one of the last military actions against the Northern Native Americans. The Wounded Knee Massacre is also what many historians cite as the last major conflict in the American Indian Wars. After this event, there are very few battles and overly violent conflicts between the United States and Indian tribes. The last interaction that can be had with the Wapiti in the world of Red Dead Redemption 2 is with Rain's Fall in 1907. Ah, uh, well... My people aren't really a tribe. We're just a bunch of families, I suppose. But we're in Canada now. This retreat to Canada is likely inspired by the Sioux chief Sitting Bull and his decision to leave Montana in 1877 and lead his people to Canada. U.S. emissaries would travel to Sitting Bull's camp promising happiness and riches if they would conform to reservation life. By early 1881, Sitting Bull would be the chief of a small band consisting of mostly elders and sick people. And on July 10, 1881, Sitting Bull would relent his rebellion and travel south to the United States, five years after his victory at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Sitting Bull would be assigned to the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, and seven years later would be killed by police officers due to his supposed participation in the Ghost Dance Uprising. That is going to wrap up our exploration and look at the real history behind the stories that inspired the Wapiti in Red Dead Redemption 2. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you want to investigate any of the information I have thrown at you throughout this video, feel free to investigate the sources I provided in the description marked by a chapter, and I will see you in the next one. Peace!